I want to start with a prayer. It's like not uncommon for a pastor to pray, right? But hear these words. Pray them, actually, just like close your eyes and pray it with me, all right? Heavenly Father, I pray that this day I may live in your presence and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray that this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. That is a prayer uh, from an author, pastor, theologian named John Stott, who prayed that prayer every day of his adult life. And I have been so moved by it since I read it a couple weeks ago, I've started to pray it myself every day. And it's so intentional and beautiful, it just has really just captured me. And so may that prayer be a reality for us today as we continue to look at what it means to keep church weird. Because we're talking about the Holy Spirit today, which for some folks is a little bit of a hard topic. But let's stand here and read from Galatians chapter 5, 13 through 25. Many of you know this passage, and if you're, if you're new to it, it's a doozy. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Woo, everybody said amen. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, we don't bite at this church, I'm just letting you know ahead of time. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Father, thank you so much for this word. Lord, we ask that you would help us indeed to encounter you in it. May the words that I've written and the words that come out of my mouth be pleasing and honorable to you. But most importantly, Lord, we want you to speak today to each and every one of our hearts so that we would not leave here the same person as when we came in. Amen. Um, Have you ever had like a great idea that you thought was awesome turn out to be like a terrible one? Right? Like you thought it through. You wrote it down, you kind of looked at everything, you even had other people like check on it for you. Like this seems like a good idea. And maybe it started out like okay, but then like it just turned out like you just knew, this is a terrible choice. This is a terrible way to go. Many of us have done this, I think we all have stories we could tell. Um, I'm going to save myself the embarrassment and not tell you any of mine. You can ask Leslie later. Ask her about chocolate and queso. Just... So talk to you later. 
But I think many of us have stories where we thought something was going to work, look good on paper, look good as a theory, didn't turn out to work out actually in our lives. And so we've learned and been conditioned that there are certain things that seem good on paper, seem good in the moment, but actually they just don't really actually work out. Now, I think some of us treat the Christian faith this way. I think many people treat the Christian faith this way. It's a great idea, a great theory, great practice maybe, like great ideas and beliefs to kind of live into, but practical way of actually living, not possible. And all you have to do is like scan over like the Sermon on the Mount and some of Paul's, like all of Paul's writings, and it can seem very difficult to follow Jesus, to actually do the things that he called us to do. Forgiving enemies and loving our neighbors and not living into anger and avoiding lust. And there are just a lot of hard teachings that Jesus has. And so I think most people just kind of keep Christianity in this very safe belief zone, right? Like, it's a nice thing. It's nice. It's good. But actually living it out, I don't think so. And you see people like this all the time. I'm always amazed at people I see, especially on the interwebs and uh, other places, who, like have, you know, cross necklaces around their necks, you know, but like they're not living anything like Jesus. But the cross is good. They grew up Christian. They're not actually going to practice it, but it's a good idea, right? And I've even had people in my life who've been in church for forever who, like, you'll talk to them about a particular thing that they have to do, usually around forgiveness. It's always really interesting. Always around forgiveness, right? Something you need to forgive, something you need to move beyond. And it's always this, like, listen, that may work for somebody else, but I ain't Jesus, there's lots of times we just kind of fall into that trap. But if we treat it like it's just a good idea, rather than a life we're striving for, then we miss out on what this is really all about, right? C.S. Lewis said this in Mere Christianity. Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. You are called to be a little Christ. If you feel intimidated and out of, the, uh, out of the realm of possibility, most people should. To be a little Jesus walking around, it's a little bit intimidating, you know? I'm at least little, short, but I, I would have a hard time calling myself a little Jesus, a little Christ. But Christianity, my friends, is not a theory. Jesus is not a visionary making impossible claims. He claimed truth. He claimed to be the Son of God. The Bible is not just a book of rules and beliefs that we just kind of willfully just kind of look at and say, oh, okay, those are nice things. They're truths and deeper truths and stories of old and new and really building blocks for how you are to live your life in the life of God. And it's meant to be real, practical, actually able to be lived out. Andy Crouch, a author and pastor, asked these two questions that he thinks are like the two most important and haunting questions for every single person on the planet. What are we meant to be? And why are we so far from what we're meant to be? You feel that gap, right? What are we meant to be? Like we spend our whole lives trying to figure out, what am I here for? All the great philosophical questions. What am I here for? What's my purpose? Who am I meant to be? And then even when you feel like you have that kind of down, you always have this tension gap between that and why am I not who I think I'm supposed to be? There's a gap there we have to recognize. And it's even more so in the Christian life, right? Who does God say we're supposed to be? Who's God say I'm supposed to be? And then why am I not there yet? Why is this journey taking longer than I would like? <laughs> We looked at this passage last week, and it doesn't help us with the feeling of the gap. But Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going back to the Father. That does not sound like theoretical language to me. It's not theory. It's not hypothetical, right? It's a promise. It's an actual promise of the Lord to each and every one of his followers who believe in him. 
And so for each and every one of us, we have to ask the question, how does something go from a nice idea to like potentially possible to a promise to a reality that I'm actually living out? If you think about anything in your life, how it goes from an idea to actually living it out, what's the difference? You do it. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I have had the idea of losing weight. It's a great idea. I have a vision of myself with probably not six packs, but like maybe two, rather than the one big pack, right? I, I would settle for two pack. I would settle for two packs. But I have this vision in my mind of myself healthier, eating lots of salad and vegetarian options at the restaurants. And it's a nice idea, but then when I drive past a restaurant or a fast food place or I meet somebody here for lunch, I usually take the opposite road. <laughs> Some of you I can't, like I can't take all the blame. Some of you just tell me, Leslie doesn't have to know. Just eat the food. It's fine. Like, don't worry about it. It's all right. You know who you are. But we have this idea, right? There's an idea to reality. It takes actually doing it. It takes living it out. And so following Jesus and living into that reality is something that he promises we can do. He's not just our rock and our firm foundation just for us to like rest and sit on, but it's meant to be a launching pad, to live an explosive life of faith. Yes, amen? It's a launching pad. And if you think about that, like think about a rocket, right? A rocket launch or a shuttle launch. Think about all the things that have to go right for the shuttle to launch, the, the literal, like, tens and tens of thousands of booklets that are written and all the instructions, all the mechanics and the engineering and the chemistry and all the, we just hope this actually works kind of stuff that goes into a rocket launching out. It seems impossible and crazy when you look at it. Absolutely nuts. How's this actually going to happen? Remember that scene in Apollo 13 um, where, you know, they've had their explosion in space, they're trying to get back, and mission control back on earth, is trying to figure out how to help them get back. And so they bring out this tub of stuff that they think is on the space shuttle, and it's just a bunch of random pieces and parts. And they're all trying to figure out how these pieces and parts are going to work together. And it's like insane. It's nuts. They got a slingshot around the moon or whatever, and all this nut, like sci-fi sounding stuff. But guess what? Those men came back. It worked. Something that looked insane on paper actually worked. It's the same thing with the life in Christ. This promise that Jesus gives of living like him and even doing greater things seems crazy, but it is possible. What can hold us back from living into that promise is believing that it's all up to us. It's all up to me and my ability and my strength. Which, if that's the case, then let's all indeed just close down the service and go somewhere for lunch. Because if it's all up to us, we've already started out failing. It's done, right? It's not all up to us. Jesus says immediately after those words, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate or helper to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. These are words I really think we read and we just kind of whoop, gloss over. These are, this is huge. This is huge, friends. I find many people are okay with believing in God. Love God, all good with that. Jesus, I believe in Jesus, I love Jesus, perfectly fine. I find many Christians who love God, love Jesus, but do not believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. They truly don't. They don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. You can feel like you're right with God, and like you're okay with Jesus. Maybe you even go as far to say, yeah, he's the way, the truth, and the life for me. That's, that's fantastic. But if you don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, you will never live like Jesus. You'll never fully understand who he is. You can't read the Bible without the Holy Spirit, right? 
Yeah, lots of people who got all kinds of great degrees and they're reading the Bible and they're doing this and that, but they don't have the Holy Spirit, so it just looks like text to them. That's all it is. You have the Holy Spirit, he illuminates, he awakens truth in you. We must believe in the Holy Spirit. Pastor Francis Chan, who I just, if you've never read a book by Francis Chan, like you need to do it. Like Francis Chan is a great author and pastor, doing great work. He's like my only like real Christian celebrity. If I would ever meet Francis Chan, I wouldn't know what to do. I'd be like, okay, let's, let's go out to eat and talk. I don't know if I'm worthy, whatever. But he, he wrote a great book about the Holy Spirit called The Forgotten God, which is a great title. The Forgotten God. I think that's right on. And look, let's, let's be honest. Some of us have had weird experiences with church and the Holy Spirit, so we're kind of like iffy about even talking about the Holy Spirit at times. Um, when I was growing up, this is all just being honest with you, I did not understand the role of the Holy Spirit in my life. Had no clue. Understood the belief in God. I understood at some point I needed Jesus in order to get to heaven, but the Holy Spirit had no clue what role he played whatsoever. And my church experience with the Holy Spirit was very, very different. So I would, my dad would like sometimes take me to church because my mom worked on the weekends. And the church that we would go to always referenced the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost, which kind of freaked me out. Let's just be honest. It weirded me out. Holy Ghost? Okay. It's a little strange. And what would happen is the pastor, who always seemed to have the Holy Ghost more than everybody else in the room, would walk over to people and slay them in the Holy Ghost. Walk up, touch, bam, knocked out on the floor. The Holy Ghost that knocks people out on the floor. So anytime anybody would be like, do you want to receive the Holy Spirit? I'd be like, I'm good. <laughs> like, I'm good. I, um, I, I want to stay standing, <laughs> okay? Not interested in a ghost that walks around knocking people out. Just not interested. And as I got older, I kind of realized, okay, that's one particular faith expression. And we're not here to criticize those that, that do church that way. Um, but that's one expression of the Holy Spirit in their tradition. But I started to notice that the Holy Spirit's work really started to show evidence in other people's lives in, in smaller ways. Yes, we want to feel the Holy Spirit move. We sang it today. We want the Spirit to rest on us. Yes, we want to feel and have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit also shows up way beyond just a worship service. Yes? One of the greatest moments I ever saw that I just knew the Holy Spirit was at work. This wasn't even just in my life. It's something I, I saw um, in the news. And maybe you remember in 2015, um, a man walked into a church in Charleston, South Carolina, sat through a Bible study, it was an African-American church, sat through a Bible study, and then brutally murdered um, nine people, ranging from 26 years of age to uh, 87. It was horrible, absolutely horrible. Sat through a Bible study, killed all these people, and many of them family and friends, obviously, of each other, some of them begging him, why are you doing this? He's obviously a racist. He wanted to rid that area of any black influence. And he did it because he didn't want that church, which was a historically black church, um, to exist anymore. And so he just wanted to kill people. That was it. And these people are begging him, stop doing this, stop doing this. We love you. We care about you. And he's mowing all their friends and family down. Now, you cut to some time later, they have the, the trial where the victims, the, uh, the family of the victims who were murdered, have the chance to speak to him. Now, some of you have seen this before, or seen even scenes like this, where they're going to get to tell him what he took from them, the pain he caused, all this stuff. And each and every one of the family members of those who were killed got up and forgave him for what he did. They prayed for him. They prayed that he would come to know the merciful love of Christ. And they forgave this man for what he did to their family. You watch that. That is a work of the Holy Spirit in some people's lives. And we see small moments like this in, in lives of people who take great sacrifice and love when love doesn't make sense and show grace where grace doesn't make sense and are a light in the most darkest of situations. And 
That is where the Holy Spirit moves. Yes, he can move in a worship service, but he also moves in your lives in very powerful, practical ways. That day, for those believers, showed an aspect of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives because they could have been trapped and enslaved to bitterness, anger, and hate, but they were freed from that. Sounds, seems almost impossible, right? One of the things the Holy Spirit does is he sets us free. He brings freedom. But freedom from what is the real question, and freedom for what is the other question we have to wrestle with, right? Because Jesus even said what we can kind of call his, his mission statement, right? He says in, in Luke's gospel, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set those who are oppressed free, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But freedom to do what? Most people hear freedom, and we love freedom. We're Americans. Right? Free, home of the brave. We love freedom. And so most of us think freedom is to do what we want. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Yeah, how's that going for you? That's what most people think about when they think about freedom. To do what you want. But the Apostle Paul turns it in his letter to the Galatians. And he tells them, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. The flesh here, human desire, human want. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. That, like, that flies in the face of every ounce of our culture. This is kingdom culture. The Spirit goes to battle for you, to you, for you to not do whatever you want. That is weird in our world. If you're free, you should do whatever you want. In fact, if you think about it, many of the things that we do, we say... It's really just being us being the true us, right? Whatever is in your heart, just follow that. And the Spirit is saying, no, I'm going to fight against that. In fact, it's backwards to the way that our culture talks, but it also reveals a kind of truth. Because the hard truth is you can't really experience freedom in the Spirit if you are living in sin. You can't live in freedom, in the spirit, if you are living in a way that actually keeps you enslaved. Sin and freedom don't mix. Galatians, he goes on, he says, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. This is a really awkward list. If you're comfortable with this list, <laughs> okay. Sexual immorality, impurity, Indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. Ooh, church needs to hear that, right? Envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I have forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is an awkward list. It's a very awkward list. Because each and every one of us can see something in that list and maybe think to ourselves, ooh, I have battled that. That has stormed at times the gates of my heart and at times has won the battle. But Paul's language is very, very clear. In 2024, some of those, some of those sins that you see up there are even said to be things that express our freedom. And represent our freedom to do what we want. But sin doesn't lead to freedom. It leads to enslavement every single time. I don't know if you've noticed this in your life. Maybe it's just me. But there are sins that I've battled in my life where I thought, oh, they, they, these things that I could do, 
especially in my younger years, these things I could do actually represent my freedom, my ability to do kind of whatever I want with my life. When in fact, what would happen is I would find myself addicted, lonely, angry, and isolated, and dark. The very things that at times our world says is evidence of your freedom is actually putting you right back into prison. I dealt with uh, an addiction when I was a younger man. And I was for sure that that was expressed because I could do what I wanted to. And instead, I was trapped. And I needed a savior. I needed someone to rescue me. And there are folks even now who think they're living free, but they are very much trapped. Sin is a black hole. It just takes and it takes and it takes and it takes. The Spirit of the Lord, on the other hand, only gives. Gives and gives and gives a life that you could not conjure up and produce on your own. And also gives you what you need in order to battle the black hole of sin in your life. This is crucially important, brothers and sisters. The Spirit gives. And so what does the Spirit give? He gives fruit. He gives evidence of Jesus at work in your life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I thought I'd like sit here and walk through with you each and every one of these. You know. You know what these words are. You know, you see it in the lives of other people around you who have the Holy Spirit. You see it. You see it in your life when it's evident. You also see it when it's not. So I feel no need to try to walk through each and every one of these and make some clever observation or whatever because it's not a mystery to you. You know what love looks like when it's real love. You know what faith looks like when it's real faith and goodness and whatnot. What I do want us to take a second and consider is how Jesus himself lived out this fruit. Because that is what the Spirit is doing in you, trying to produce Christ in and through you. Not a better, nicer, cleaner, religious version of you. What's trying to sprout up and through you is Jesus. And so how did Jesus show love? Obviously, he gave the greatest demonstration of love with his death on the cross. And he said, Greater love has none than these than the one that lays down one's life for one's friends. Jesus, filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit, would pray often, I praise the Father, Lord of heaven, on earth. Jesus lived with joy. And he brought peace. He said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives, but do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He was patient. Oh, Lord, I was going to go through this and try to talk about how he was with his disciples. How has he been patient with you, friends? He has been patient with us, yes? Oh, my word. You look at the disciples and you're like, these idiots. They don't get it. Look in the mirror, dude. (laughs) We don't get it. How patient has God and Jesus and the Spirit been with you? He's kind. He's so kind. We are deserving of so much wrath. But he's kind. And he's good. Peter writes in Acts 10 that Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. He did good things. He was goodness. He was faithful to the Father. Faithful to his mission. He's faithful to you who claim him as Lord of your life. He is faithful and he's gentle. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. He is indeed the good, gentle shepherd. When at times you and I need a little knock on the head, right? We need the shepherd's staff to kind of whack us upside the head and lead us this way, but he's gentle with us. He's gentle And one of the things we don't talk enough about is how self-controlled Jesus was. He could have gave it all up. He could have walked away from the mission God had laid on him. But instead he said, 
Your will be done, not my own. And he showed self-control even up until the moment of his own death. He shows self-control for the larger good. God wants you to experience these fruits in your lives, friends, because he wants to produce Christ in and through you. God knows far better how to do that than you do. Some of you have tried to live the Jesus life, and you've tried to do it in your own strength and in your own ability, and it's usually turned out to be a mess. You weren't religious enough, you couldn't pray enough, you couldn't read your Bible enough, you couldn't figure all this out enough. It's not up to you. You just got to surrender. Christ will work in and through your lives as you continue to say, okay, I don't have this all figured out, I'm just going to follow Jesus and live by his Spirit. At the end of the day, the Spirit empowers us to live like Jesus. That's what this is all about. You want to live like Jesus? You need the Holy Spirit in your life. You just do. The Spirit's power is close to you. I don't know how close you feel like God is, but the Spirit's power moving in and through your life is as close as the next choice you're going to make. It's not impossible. Some of us think following Jesus is like this impossible thing to do and whatnot. The Holy Spirit's work in your life is right there. Jesus called it the wind, right? He said, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell wherever it comes or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. For whatever reason, we keep getting trapped into thinking this is about our ability and like we just can't figure it out. The Spirit is right here, ready to work. Ready to work in and through you. He wants to close that gap between where you are and where God is calling you to be. Now, I want to end with this. Rather than beating yourself up or thinking you can't follow Jesus faithfully and you can't do it well in faith and see these fruits grow in you, when was the last time you asked the Holy Spirit for help? Like, truly. When was the last time you asked for the Spirit's help? We are an incredibly helpless culture. We need something from somebody all the time, right? We are always trying to find a way to, I'm going to say take the easy way out, but to deal with the things that we deal with in this life, our anxieties, our stresses, our this and our that. And we are always on the search for whatever next fix it might be, the next therapy session I might need. And some of you might need real clinical therapy. Don't hear me say that you don't. But there are some things that you experience in this life especially as a follower of Jesus, where we think we need help from this person, this person, this person, this thing, this thing, this thing, when really you just haven't asked the Spirit for help. You haven't asked the Spirit for help. You haven't allowed Him to wash and work over you. And look, the Spirit was present at the beginning, right? Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, The Spirit of God is hovering over your chaos. He's right there hovering over your darkness, ready to act, ready to move. Is it easy? No. Do you need church community to help bring that alive in your life? Yes. But the Spirit is there. You need only ask. You need only ask for help. And maybe the Holy Spirit's way of helping you is bringing you to other people who can help you. Yes? Are we tracking? This is important. In a world that thinks it just needs help from all these other things, we have to be weird enough to say, yes, I'm fine with getting help from outside, but I also know that if I'm a Christian, the Holy Spirit is my helper. There's a power that comes from that, friends, that many Christians are just kind of going, nah, well, we'll just see. Don't. Don't do that. And so if you're somebody also who is fine with belief in God, fine with Jesus, but you've not really explored what it means to be a person of the Spirit and don't have the Spirit living in and through you, challenging you today, don't allow your life to live that way. You'll never honestly be a true Christian without the power of the Holy Spirit. And you have to make a choice. Each of us do, right? Living in a world of self-centric despair, we want to be a people who choose love, right? 
Instead of comparing ourselves to everybody else around us and whatnot, we want to be a people of joy. Instead of having contempt, we want to have peace. Instead of being impatient and just kind of not able to, to see what God's doing and working, we want to have patience. In order to kind of dispel the hostile nature of our environments that we walk into, we want to be a people of kindness and goodness. And as rather than being forgetful and just kind of not able to live into the life God's called you to, because it's not on your mind, we want to be a faithful people. Rather than being a world of outrage, we want to bring a culture of gentleness. And with an entire culture that is obsessed with reckless indulgence, we want to show self-control. You will not do it on your own. But here's the best part. The Holy Spirit is right here in your midst to do the work. You need only ask and live into it. Isn't this not good news? Let's pray. Father, we want to be these people. These words carry so much weight to them. It can feel impossible. It can feel out of reach. But you are so unbelievably close, ready to do this work in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be a people who surrender, to walk by the power of your Spirit each and every day. Lead us to people that need to see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We love you, Lord, and we're expecting you to do that work. Help us to live with open hands to receive and live into it. Amen.